Welcome to Applique. What is Applique? Applique is the method of applying color to fabric by using a second piece of fabric on top of the first rather than stitching lots of thread to infill the design. That's reasonable for small surface areas, but that's a lot of thread and a lot of stitching for larger items. Especially for heraldic designs, you'll find that in period and now, applique tends to be the go-to. I like applique because it's a lot of blingy flash for the absolute minimum of effort, and we love that. Uh, this is an incomplete UFO. It's been in a box since about 1986. I'll finish it someday. <laughs> You'll see applique with couched edges very often. In fact, nearly always. It helps reinforce the edges. And it's a really effective way to put metallic thread into the design. But you'll also see applique done with more humble fabrics and with ordinary corded edges. And these sorts of large heraldic designs are pretty much exactly what applique is best at. That's not the sort of thing you would ever want to have to embroider the entire surface with thread. Holy cow. So that's why we like applique. Applique is probably fairly ancient. There's not a lot of early surviving examples, but if you look toward the back of the handout, you'll see several that are fairly instructive for how it can be used. This is actually a 14th century banner. And you'll see it's applique, with the couched edges and embroidery augmenting the fabric. That helps to strengthen it and gives it a little extra attractiveness. Dimension. Yeah. Period aesthetics tend to go for complexity and richness of texture, mm. and augmenting the applique can allow you to do that. Um, again, use of heraldry, tabards, and this Italian fragment is believed to possibly be horse trappings. Mm. Not sure about that. No one is. And there's a rich trove of 15th century Scandinavian applique and reverse applique with a little close up there. And right up through the Renaissance, on the past page, you can see how delicate and rich it can be. There's no metallic thread in this, but the varied colors. And notice it's not one piece of fabric doing this. It's lots and lots of pieces. One of the lovely things about applique is you can use it for all your scraps. See, this is what my method is going to get rid of, pins. This is the no pin method of applique. I've seen the shops where they've got those little applique pins. They're 200 in a box and they're about this big. And from that, I assume that somebody out there is using those in mass quantities and they're falling out of the fabric onto the floor where the person in the household who is not the person sewing is invariably going to step on them. They fall out, they snag on your thread, they poke your fingers. Let's do this without pins. Let's do it without sticky iron-on stuff. Let's do it without fussy ironing. Ironing isn't even period, so let's not do any of that. I decided after sitting gate duty at Griffin's Fest that we needed a tablecloth to clearly identify gate. So I'm making one. The first thing we need to do is create a pattern. I used ordinary paper and just freehanded it. You can find clip art and print it out, enlarge it in your computer. If you don't have a computer that can do that, take it down to Office Max, have them enlarge it for you. You can even do things larger than standard printer paper by tiling it. And if you don't have the software for that, Office Max will do it for you. This is paper. That's very convenient if you're only doing something once or twice and it's flat. If you're going to do a repeated design or it's large and awkward, 
I prefer to use non-woven fabric. Again, not period. If you go to the fabric store, they'll charge you six or eight bucks a yard for this stuff and it's narrow. Go to Goodwill, buy vintage bed skirts. Bed skirt has a really pretty fabric about this wide all the way around the edge. At the entire middle on most of them, is non-woven stuff, and you'll get six or eight yards of it, depending on the size, for about five dollars. We like this. What is non-woven? It is sort of the same stuff they make masks out of these days. It mm -hmm. is more of a synthetic felt. Very thin. It doesn't ravel. It doesn't stretch. It's it doesn't fall apart doesn't when it gets wet. So I have made my patterns. And this is going to be like one of those cooking shows where they make the lasagna, put it in the top oven, and then they pull mm -hmm. the finished lasagna out of the bottom five minutes later. So here's a pattern. I drew it, cut it out, and now I'm going to transfer it to my fabric. I happen to have this scrap of linen. I'm going to lay my pattern on it. I want to have ideally about an inch around my design. A little less will do, but having a little more is handy. Now I'm going to use an ink pen to transfer it. This is a stupid expensive fabric store mm -hmm. erasable marker. Mm -hmm. These are children's markers that are supposed to not stain clothes. You can get like a set of 10 mm -hmm. for a couple of dollars. Those work really nicely, they wash out. These are the new friction markers that erase with heat. Mm -hmm. And that heat can come with literally erasing with friction or <laughs> ironing or aiming a hair dryer in its general direction. Mm -hmm. So I've decided these are excellent mm -hmm. and I recommend them. If you want to keep it really authentic, you can use a little dab of paint or something. It doesn't matter if it's erasable though, because everything we're doing with this isn't going to show later, even if it was permanent. What I'm going to do now is mark the edge. I'm just gonna hold it down and give myself a dot line. I could draw a continuous line, but some fabrics, if it pulls and snags when you're doing that, mm -hmm. It's also, honestly, I think a little more work. And I just find this is faster and perfectly adequate. Mm -hmm. She's got a lot of tricks. Mm -hmm. So how close do you have to adhere to your model? Well, personally, um, the pattern is not the boss of me, and I feel entirely <laughs> free to change it on the fly if I feel like it. It's my pattern. I created it. I can destroy it. See, this is the great thing about being the artist in charge. You get to play God with your materials. Now I've transferred it. All done. Now, what am I going to do? Cut it out? No! We are never ever going to cut them out again. At least not before we sew it down. And this is the main thing I want you to take away from this entire class. Don't cut it out, that's hard. I'm gonna trim it back a little, maybe to a reasonable, approximate rectangle. Giving myself about an inch of space. If you've got a shape on your design, if it's sort of basically triangular or circular, you don't have to cut out your scraps to be square. If you've got a weird shaped scrap, go with it. The advantage to this is all of the lines are in the direction of the grain of the fabric. It's less likely to stretch and be weird when you set it down. You also want to lay down the design so that the grain of the fabric underneath is going to line up with mm -hmm. this. It's not absolutely essential, but it does make life much easier. If your scraps just don't fit that way, then they don't fit that way. But if you can make it work that way, try for it. It'll be better for it. That looks about right. 
make sure I've got it more or less on the grain. Looks good to me. I'm going to pick any old needle. Now what we're going to be doing next is not an endeavor that requires delicacy or precision, unless you're working with an extremely delicate fabric, like one of the finer silks. And instead of using a matching thread, I'm going to use a thread that is garishly contrasting. Whatever you've got around, some thread you have no conceivable use for. All right, am I going to put a knot in my thread now? No, none of that. What am I going to do? I am going to do a running stitch, basting this fabric onto the backing fabric. So I'm just gonna pull it through and then just a quick back stitch. Good enough. And I'm just going to do nice long basting stitches. If I've got a big indent in my design, I'll do a little side detour. Are you outside of your marking line? I am. It's probably hard to tell, okay. but I am about a half an inch away okay. from my design. All right. That's why I want to have about an inch of margin. Okay. All right. So, about so half I've got an inch plenty of room for edges. this mm -hmm. to be nearby, but not in the way. Okay. So what I'm and doing is effectively pinning it, but I'm pinning it with thread instead of pins, which in period were expensive and hard to get, and nowadays are annoying and just Perfect. unnecessary entirely. Perfect. I don't know about you, but I carry my handwork around with me. I stuff it in a basket, I pull it out. Um, most of my hand sewing gets done sitting cross-legged on the couch watching television, and I don't want pins falling out when I'm doing that. Okay, now I've got to the end of where this is going, and I'm just going to do a little back stitch there. Mm -hmm. And now I can't oh. pull out. That's all. Okay. Got and it. I would continue yeah. all the way around it, but mm -hmm. time to go to the lasagna in the next oven. Mm -hmm. So instead of watching me finish that, here's one that I have essentially finished. All right, and you've gone all around your design. I've gone all the way around Not the design. the square of the fabric. You've gone around the design. I could go around the square of the fabric, but there's no particular right. need for me to go out to the right, corner. Right, right. Um, I find that having the square of the fabric, sometimes I'll go all the way out if it's a big, complex shape. I'll do the square first, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. come back and do the oh, intersections. Yeah. Okay. Sure to Here, that. I'll be adding extra mm -hmm. in this hollow spot. Mm -hmm. And I'm also going to be doing a little more in any place where the design is wide. Mm. If I have an animal with a thick body, if I have a roundel or an apple or something like that, I might do just a little mm. stitch to hold a spot that might otherwise want to be a, a little floppy. Is there any problem with keeping things flat as you're basting it in? No, I just keep it on the table. Um, as I said, I normally do this sort of thing sitting cross-legged in front of the TV, and I use those um, leftover political yard signs that normally go in the dumpster. <laughs> depending oh, on my yeah. mood, I use one from a politician I like or a politician I don't, and you know, I depending on how much stabbing I'm going to be doing on the surface. <laughs> And I live in a house with shag carpet, so I actually have a pile of those political yard signs, and I just spread them out when I need to lay out fabric flat. So I use one as a lap desk when I sew. So here we are, and now I'm going to start the sewing. Here's the thread I cut earlier, and this actually is a matching thread, more or less. On this, I have options. Because this is a relatively coarse set of fabrics, I can put a knot in it and no one will notice. If you're doing a more delicate fabric, you might not want to tie a big old knot. The usual knot, rolling it off across a wet finger, gives you that little lump. It's not bad. 
I'm going to go ahead and do that, but I will show you in a moment how to do it in a way that is tidier. So what do we do to start? Um, we've got little pointy snippy scissors. They actually make special applique scissors that have a blunt tip on the bottom so it doesn't catch both of your fabrics. Mm. But I'm not that posh, so I just use these. I usually start toward the outside of a design. If it has an inside, I'll save that for later. Mm. And I'm going to pick a spot about a quarter inch away. Mm. Here's my so line. Not on the line, okay. Not on the line. I'm creating a seam allowance. Mm -hmm. And I've just got a couple of inches there. Mm -hmm. And I try to do it on a straightaway rather mm -hmm. than a complicated spot. See that? Sure. Now what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take my threaded needle with the knot and I'm going to bring it up just inside of my dotted line. Remember the mm -hmm. dotted line is not going to be part of the design. Mm -hmm. It was on the outside of my pattern. If I went on the line, it would end up bigger than my pattern. So I'm going where the edge of the pattern was, not where the dots are, which are slightly outside that. Now, I'm going to turn it under just enough to hide the dots. Notice that the thread comes up right in the middle of the cut area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't want to cut it off completely because by leaving it attached, mm -hmm. everything is well-mannered mm -hmm. and restrained and it stays put. Mm -hmm. I'm That's going to go advantage. straight down, opposite where my thread came up, mm -hmm. go just a little along, come back up, catching the edge of the fabric. How much is it folded under there? Um, you can see how far the snip is from the line. Mm -hmm. It's a little more than a quarter inch on this because it's a large, mm -hmm. imprecise pattern with not a lot of detail. So I'm cutting a quarter inch away from the marked line. Mm -hmm. If this was much bigger, I might do a half an inch. If I was doing something small and delicate mm -hmm. like this, you can imagine that the seam allowances on this were quite a bit smaller. So I'm going to continue and I'll get a few stitches along. Again, I come down right opposite where the thread came up. So, oh, on this, because it is a large thing, partly so that you can oh, see it on here for video. If I was doing something delicate or with a lot of tight contours, I would put the stitches closer together. As I go, I use the point of the needle or my finger to just keep tucking that seam allowance under. And now I've gotten to where it's gonna to start to pull if I keep going. So I take my scissors and I snip a little further. And I can continue to tuck it under. I use my needle to keep it nice and even. So you're going into the under fabric and then coming out uh, the yes. over fabric. Okay. Now there's no reason you have to do it that way. I find that it works for me. Right. I find if I go in the over fabric and come out the under fabric, it works almost just as well. Okay. But right now you're going into the under. Fabric. Yes. The main reason I'm doing that is simply because I started with the knot in my over fabric. Gotcha. And I'm going to continue to work my way around, tucking to hide my dotted line as I go. So it doesn't matter if I used a permanent ink because it'll never show. <coughs> and the nice thing about applique is it can really go quite quickly once you're in the groove. Mm -hmm. If the only stitching I'm going to be doing is the applique itself, I would put my stitches somewhat close together. But I'm going to be cording the edge later, which means I'm going to be sewing it over again. And that means that my initial stitches can be a little broadly spaced and they don't have to be perfectly precise. And now we're getting to a point in this design where the curvature is becoming tighter. Up till now, it's been close enough to straight and it's on the bias. 
Fabric has a grain, which is the direction of the fibers. We can say there's grain and cross grain, but let's keep it simple. There's the direction of the thread, and then there's diagonal to the thread. And fabric is stretchy on the diagonal, where it is far less stretchy on the grain. That stretch means that when we tuck under the excess seam allowance on a bias curve, it accommodates that outer edge of the seam allowance. That's a greater curvature. It's a longer radius, so it has to compress to tuck under. But because it's on the bias, it can do that. It's fine with that, but we're approaching a section that is both closer to being on the grain and a much tighter curve. So this is an outer curvature. This is the convex curve. So I'm going to snip it and I'm going to snip little pie slices out of it. I'm going to take those snips to just shy of my dotted line, not right up to the dotted line, because the fabric still has some give, and I don't want my snips to go right up to where I'm sewing. You have to remove it. Ah. You need to remove it if you have heavy fabric, especially. Mm -hmm. But when it's an outer curve, you need to remove sorry, it so that it can compress yeah. inward yeah. without overlapping. Yeah. But when I tried this, I cut it so that it could overlap, but I let it overlap. I did not remove. Yes, you absolutely can overlap it, especially if it's thinner. If it's thicker, you may find that the bulk, especially on a stiffer fabric, is awkward. It's not wrong to overlap it. I often do that. And making that choice for when it's okay to just let the give of the fabric accommodate, when you need to switch over to making some kind of action. Snipping it is sufficient, especially for a relatively soft curve. But we're going to get up here where it's a much tighter curve. And if I don't remove the pie slice from the snips, they're going to overlap a lot. Mm -hmm. And I find it easier to remove the pie slices. Mm -hmm. But that's your choice as the artist, whether that little bit of overlap is troubling to you and annoying mm -hmm. or not. When we're working with an inner curve here, we don't need to remove a pie slice because those sections are going to fan outward underneath. So I'm going to abandon this little bit here and start another thread to demonstrate that. Tacking it down ahead of time makes it so much easier. I can see. That <laughs> is the me you know. That's the whole. That's the whole class right there. I'm doing all this other <laughs> stuff just to pad out the time. I think I thought flip it as you go. That was yeah, something I came up thing. with yeah, while I was like, working yeah, on this, which I most did most of on a road trip between Alberon and Lac Salon in the mid '80s, and the realization that. Once I cut out the circles yeah. and fastened down the outer circle, the outer circle held it down while I did the inner circle. And in fact, I worked on this with two needles, snipping in between, stitching along the inner circle and stitching along the animal, right. cutting a little more, stitching the animal right. and more circle, mm -hmm. snipping a little more, wow. cutting the animal in the right. circle. That's and I don't know if I invented this technique. It seems so simple, but I'm sure other people have figured it out. But it was an epiphany that has served me well. Well, what your work in progress stages look like is also Hawaiian quilting. It looks a lot like Hawaiian quilting. Yeah, yeah. And so this makes sense if you're trying to replicate that. I am not familiar with Hawaiian quilting, but uh, basically big, elaborate reverse mm -hmm. applique type applique. stuff. Yes, yeah, so I'm familiar with Guatemalan reverse applique, and that might have been in my head when I started doing it that way. Mm -hmm. um, reverse applique is when you overlap both pieces, and then the design is the part you remove to expose oh, yeah, the yeah, bottom yeah. fabric. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, very similar. So here we are on an 
concave inner curve. And I'm going to show you that other option for knots. We have lots of options for knots. I'm going to make one option is just to put the knot on the bottom of the fabric. If it's not going to show, who cares? But what I'm going to do here, I'm going to go ahead and snip. And this is essential to snip because if I don't, it will pull funny. It's on the bias, but still. So now when I tuck it under, it can fan out. I'm going to go right up to this inner corner here. And I could make a knot in my thread and come up underneath like I did before. Sometimes you'll find that the knot is lumpy. Whether or not it's an issue for you is for you to decide. But I'm going to do this. I'm going to demonstrate it out here where you can see me rather than here. You're probably familiar with the way that we tie off a thread. After we've finished our seam, we loop it, run the needle through the loop. Why wait for the end? Go ahead and do it when you start. So mm. you could come up between the layers of the applique and the base fabric. And I'm going to pretend that's what I'm doing here. And I'm just going to put a finger on that temporarily. Give myself that little loop. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tie it off just as if it was the end of the seam instead of the beginning. Mm -hmm. And that's a much neater thing than a big knot at the end of the thread. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In fact, it's so neat that I could do it right here. I could just go right through the top of my fabric, come up in the spot where I want it, let the tail slide through. I'm going to hold that down, run through it. Being ambidextrous is kind of handy. Loop through. It's hardly visible, and when I continue to sew, no one will notice it. And especially if I'm going to cord the edges, it'll be completely hidden later. Moving on to the next oven full of lasagna. Any questions about the actual sewing? I have one a little bit. Yes. Would that technique work, this, work the same way if you were trying to put a sleeve or some other round thing on a piece with this little... Slices yes, out. that's exactly how round necklines are done. Uh, snip. I struggled hard with this. <laughs> yeah, so when I did this neckline, it was snip, snip, snip here, where it was a tighter curve here. I just relied on the give of the fabric. That's what I've been failing at. Thank you. And for the underarm here, snip, snip. And that's why there's bias tape to cover those snippies. Gotcha. When you have a square neckline or relatively straight, you can roll the fabric in on itself, but it's a little difficult to do that when you have a very tight curve, especially on a sleeve where there's a lot of abrasion. So you'll find that by snipping and then using tape, either store-bought bias tape, I prefer to make my own because I, it's more flexible fabric, that store-bought bias tape is awfully stiff. So I just buy like a fat quarter of, you know, cotton, broadcloth at the Walmart near me and cut it on the diagonal and you've got bias tape. Oh, bias tape's cut on the bias. Yes, yes. Cut on the bias. that's why it has oh, curves. Yes. That's why you use it. If you're curves. doing it on a straight seam, you can do grain tape yeah, on the grain of the fabric. Mm -hmm. You do bias tape so that it has that give and mm -hmm. that ability to curve. And honestly, store-bought bias tape is it's stiff. And using all cotton bias tape, that I make myself. I don't even iron the little folds in it. I just sew it down and fold it over as I go, just like I'm doing here. First off, ironing isn't period. Second, why make more work for yourself if you don't have to? I am not a fan of that. So this one, I've gone pretty far around. So I just have this little final bit to do. So I'm going to snip that loose. 
turn it under. Now, I am not a fan of embroidery hoops for this. Um, I feel that it's better to lay the fabric flat. Stuffing it into an embroidery hoop seems to inevitably pull the fabric out of alignment. What was more typical in period was an embroidery frame, which actually looks a lot like a picture frame. Um, if you wanna make one, I suggest going to Michael's, one of these discount art supply places and getting four stretcher bars that they use for stretching painter's canvas on. They fit together with little notches and the fabric gets laced around it so that when you're done, it sort of looks like a trampoline. And using a frame, the real advantage of it is that you can have one hand on the top, one hand on the bottom, which is a little more difficult to do if it's loose, but not impossible. I generally prefer to leave it loose if I can't work on the flat. So I'm just going to finish this up here. Would that apply to embroidery as well then? Hmm? Would that apply to That was couching, yes. And if you notice in some of the illustrations I included, it is more common than not, at least in the surviving examples, for applique to be augmented with both edge couching and surface couching. And often with other embroidery stitches as well. That Italian example, it's difficult to tell if it's a chain stitch, but I think it's a split stitch. As well as surface couching, Okay, so I've gone all the way around. Now what am I going to do? I'm going to tie a knot. So I can either pull it through and tie the knot on the back, or I can do a tidy little knot on the front just snugged up really close. Either way, it's pretty much the same. I'm gonna go ahead and do this as a surface knot just so you can see. I'm sure you can all figure out how to tie a knot on the back for yourself. So there's my loop, turning it through, tying it snug. Now I'm gonna take my loose end, and this is the great thing about applique, just run it between the layers. Whoop. And now that tail is vanished forever. Yeah. You see the knot is only slightly more visible than the stitching was. So, yeah. Now, this is the fun part. We get to pull out all of these little threads. All of our basting threads, we just go yank. You can just tease them out like that. Yank. You know, if it's a really long one, just snip it somewhere. This is the most fun part. And suddenly it looks real. And isn't this beat putting all those pins back in the pin cushion? <laughs> isn't that pretty? It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like the big reveal. Mm -hmm. You know what they call it on the reality shows now? Mm -hmm. So you got the front side? Hmm? Yeah. Okay. So what do we do now? Cord is relatively smooth and crisp and what I would call hard cord. Yarn doesn't work well, it's too fluffy. This is not actually the same cord I used here, but this is one I use a lot because it's inexpensive. It's hemp cord. Where do you send your shop for it? Um, you can get oh, it yeah. at any hobby store in the section where they have like the macrame ba bracelet surprise. Oh, okay. Oh, um, okay. You can also get it on eBay. It comes in lots of colors. Um, you can also find twist cord. Twist cord is very period for this. Um, having any kind of visible twist is great, but it can also be a braided cord. It doesn't matter. They're all period. Mm -hmm. but it should be crisp and not something that necks down and fluffs because it's too soft. You want it to be so a nice firm line. Not a sweater yarn, no. 
Sometimes I have to go looking a little bit to find something that seems like it's a good weight. Mm. Or do you want the dimension? I want, want the dimension, the yes. So, because we're always making compromises when we sew with modern materials. For some people, keeping the proper fiber content is essential. For me, I'd rather have the look. So, a lot of this is nylon because it was the right weight and a good color and a good texture. But you can often find cotton. I like this hemp stuff. This is entirely done in hemp cord in addition to the metallic. The metallic is a braided cord, which is, I think it's 10 yards for $3. We like that price. Mm. These are 100 yards mm. for typically $8. And it's quite common to see the couching done in a contrasting color. Sometimes it's a matching color, sometimes it's contrasting. I personally think that the textured effect you get by using a contrasting thread is kind of cool. And using an undyed linen for the couching is actually extremely common. Uh, I like this very thin um, crochet thread for that. If you have actual linen thread, go ahead and use it, but this is cheap and I can get it in my small town. The first thing to do is get this stuffed into a convenient spot between the layers. And it can be any spot, but I tend to go for inside corners. Using a big fat tapestry needle, um, the kind they use for cruel embroidery is also good. Tapestry needles, the reason they're called that is they're blunt, they're not pointy. And that means you can kind of winkle them between the layers without snagging anything. But for this sort of thing, even those fat children's needles, yeah, those will do. Also perfectly all right to just let the end hang out. You can always trim it down later. I'm going to be using this crochet thread, which is an off-white that looks a lot like an undyed linen. I'm going to winkle it underneath so it won't show later. Come up to the outside of the cord. Okay, so that knot is now underneath. And I'm going to stitch this along. I'm going to, when I do the cord, I usually come up over the edge and then I move it down. And notice that it's quite closely spaced. That's typical of period cord couching because you don't want it to snag. And it also is quite ornamental. So I'm you're gonna, not going through the cord, you're going around it. Is I'm going correct? around it, yes. So I came up there. I'm going to go down again into the edge of the covering cloth and just over. If you have it in a frame, you can do one hand above, one hand below. This looks like the most exacting part. It would be, but one of the advantages of these very hard cords is mm -hmm. they tend to be self-straightening. Mm -hmm. When you have a very soft, flexible cord, it wants to go all over the place. And if your threads are all over the place, your tack stitches are all over the place, the cord will be all over the place. But one side of it is being restrained by the applique, which is forming a fence. And the other side, although it's open, all I'm really doing is lashing it to the fence created by the applique fabric itself. I want to keep my up thread and my down in pretty close alignment. If you ever decide to do the cording and the applique as a single process, you need to make especially sure that the spot where the thread comes up and where it comes down are very close together. Because for instance, if I were to put the needle down over here, the cord could end up over here. It'll drift if it's a wide stitch. And worse, because if I put the thread in here, 
it could actually go under the fabric if I haven't already tacked it down. So, so what you mean by doing it as a single process, you mean that the same stitch that tacks the... I um, could have been laying the cord while I did the sewing. So it's the same, it, same stitch does both. Yes. Uh -huh. But you need to make extra sure that your stitches are almost in exactly the same spot when you come up, catch the fabric. Because if they are widely offset, the cord can end up underneath your fabric. Mm -hmm. Nearly always ends up underneath the fabric. I'm just going to say that. You need to be more meticulous, and that's kind of tedious and less relaxing. It's a little like herding cats. Oh, by the way, this tail here, now that I've got it started, snip, give it a little wiggle and it's gone. You never want to stop and start a couching cord any more often than necessary. Figuring out ways to do a continuous loop from one end to the other without ever stopping the cord is preferable because you have to go through the business of tucking it under if you stop it. You can double it back on itself and bind it if you can't pull it through. And when I do this one, I'm planning to go up and around and cross over here because I think that will look nice on this particular versal letter. And so my final end would be right here. Just as this was one continuous line because I started here, went all the way around back and ended here. Because I think it wanted to have that line there. Sometimes you have to do separate lengths, but sometimes if I didn't want to have this line cutting across here, if I wanted to have this here and this here, and I couldn't do it continuously. You can tuck it under. You can tuck it under, and it can burrow through and pop up out the other side. <laughs> okay. And it's almost always preferable to have it burrow under using a blunt tapestry needle. Mm -hmm. and big, fattest, bluntest tapestry needle you can find, even those kitty plastic ones, than it is to try to stop and start it. It's also more secure. You've got no ends to come loose. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to stitch right to the end and then try to stuff it under. That's usually a pain. So I'm just going to winkle it right in there. Now you can go out the top here. If you've got a really delicate fabric like a silk, you probably don't want to do that. Aim for the other side, which you can do with a tapestry needle. If it, you can go to the other side without actually snagging anything because it's blunt. You can pop it out the other side and pull. And then you don't have a hole in your silk. This is linen, it's fine, but uh, silk might leave a mark. You can also pull it out the back or the bottom. Okay, so there it goes. And I can finish couching it down. By the way, um, we could have a whole nother class on couching, but this technique is called topside couching where your cord stays on the surface and the binding thread goes up and down. There's another technique called underside couching where the cord goes up and down and the binding thread stays on the back. Hmm. That's more typically done with gold because if you're doing a lot of gold, metal thread, which is actually in period wrapped with metal, it's extremely stiff. And underside couching is done in period when you need to have flexibility in the garment in spite of massive amounts of metal thread. Because each one of those pop downs and pull back up is like a hinge. You can think of topside couching as a sewing machine where the bobbin tension is too loose. And underside couching is like machine sewing where the top tension is too loose. Okay, now I've gotten to the end here and I need to tie off my binding cord. I could just plunge it to the back. And honestly, that's probably what I'll do on this. I'm not gonna leave this, I'll redo that section. But plunging it to the back and tying it off there probably suit the best for this. But I still could 
be a fairly discreet little knot tucked underneath the cord and largely hidden.